in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, which is our major text, lists seven doctrines that separate the Christian church and the world from world religions. He puts them out to Ephes to the, in the book of Ephesians to the church at Ephesus, a Gentile church who really is in the thick of uh, religions of the world. And so he gives of seven doctrines. We are in the second of the seven. We're talking about the one spirit. He's talked about the one body, and now he's talking about the one spirit. The reason I've spent a little bit of time of, uh, here is because of the importance of the advent of the Holy Spirit. There are two enormous event, advents of the new covenant. The advent of Christ, the first advent of Christ, which is going to lead to a second advent of Christ, and the advent of the Holy Spirit. In between the first advent of Christ and the second advent of Christ is the advent of the Holy Spirit. This is an enormous principle of the Christian life between these two advents under the new covenant. And so I thought I would spend a little bit of time since it's such an important doctrine uh, to the Christian life in the church age. So what I did, there are more than nine, but I picked out nine characteristics of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit that Jesus outlined in his last great sermon to his disciples out of John 14, 15, and 16. These nine, these nine factors, these nine factors are going to become important to us as we look at the ministry, the dynamics of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have not, what, I didn't know I was going to do them in sets of three, but it wound up that I wound up doing these nine in sets of three. So today I'm doing seven, eight, nine of the characteristics. Now, what is kind of interesting to me myself is this is the fourth lesson on the one spirit. Uh, that's I had no intentions originally to do that, but the deeper I got into it, the more I felt led to, to, to talk about this. The last three, the last three characteristics that Jesus outlined in John 14, 15, and 16, here they are. I put them on your paper. I don't know that we really think about this. I don't know that we really understand the importance of 7, 8, 9, especially 7. The seventh characteristic I listed for you is the indwelling Holy Spirit fills the void of the absence of Christ on the earth. I hope that will become a big point in your Christian life after today. The eighth one that we're going to look at is that the indwelling Holy Spirit guides the believer in all divine truth. It is divine truth that separates you from the cosmic system of lies. Like John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, divine truth, and it, you say, will separate you. The eighth or the ninth one is that I'm not sure that we pay much that much attention to this one either. The indwelling Holy Spirit discloses New covenant doctrines essential to the church. All right, here's where we're going this morning, okay? We're going to deal, we're going to deal with those three. We're going to open a whole new, uh, hopefully, a whole new idea on these three ministries of the indwelling Holy Spirit that you may have not thought about that Jesus really emphasized in John 14, 15, and 16. When he exposed the disciples, he's got to leave, and the Holy Spirit is coming. And if he doesn't leave, the Holy Spirit will not come. So the coming of the Holy Spirit is in the place of Jesus leaving the earth for a period of time. 
and it's a big deal. Let's pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit in order to study this wonderful book, a spiritual book for spiritual living for spiritual people. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be in three categories that you could, should consider through your priesthood of confession. That would be mental attitude, sin, sense of the tongue, and overt sin. If you're aware of it, then you should confess it before study. It takes you out of carnality into spirituality of 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. And allow the great ministry that we're going to talk about today to actually work in this service for you right now. To fill the void in your life of the absence of Christ from the earth. To guide you into all truth. And to disclose the important new covenant doctrines for your life. And so our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. We pray, Father, that they would do the very thing that was requested of them through their priesthood, and that is to be sure that they are under the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit in the teaching hour so that he can guide us into all truth, that he can expose us or disclose to us uh, the great teachings of the new covenant for our dispensation, the church, and that he would teach us that our heart can be filled with the joy of Christ, even in his absence from the world, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. The seventh characteristic of the indwelling Holy Spirit, that's the IHS on your paper, fills the void of the absence of Christ from the world. Now, you probably don't think that much about it, so I'm going to give you a Bible verse. I want you to put your eyes on it. Go to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. And I want, to, I want to emphasize the importance of this point. 2 Corinthians. Keep going to Romans. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. You'll be familiar with that when you see it. I want to bring that passage into your life today in this discussion on the seventh characteristic. Verse 6, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, Therefore, having always, being always of good courage and knowing that while at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, that absence he's talking about is that we're not, we're not present with the Lord because he's seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Okay. While we are at home in this body, we are absent, absent from his presence because he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Then he says we, we walk by faith, not sight, in this absence. In this absence, you understand this absence? We walk by faith, not by sight. Now watch verse 8. We are a good courage, good courage, I say, prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. See, the word absent is used twice. Agreed? The absence that I'm want to discuss with you today is the absence while he's seated at the right hand of God the Father we're in the body waiting on him to come back we are absent right from his presence when we leave this body then we are immediately in his presence you hear this priest at funerals a lot good one Jesus addressed that very issue of in this body, absent from the presence of the Lord in the seventh characteristic in his discussion of John 14, 15, and 16. 
The seventh characteristic of the indwelling Holy Spirit fills the void of the absence of Christ while Christ is in, its, is in session at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. That's, the, that's your proof text on that. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is given a new covenant title. He is referred to by Jesus Christ as the helper or the comforter, which is the parakletos, the Greek word. It could be translated helper or comforter. Most English translations translate it that way. I do like the idea of comforter, the parakletos, because that word in the Greek, really, that's the strongest definition of that word. Now, it was used with a person who has the capability... The comforter means that that's a characteristic of his life. He's a comforter. He's the comforter. In the absence of Christ, you're, you're pay attention now. In the absence of Christ, the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit is a comforter to your soul. Do you pay attention to that? If you're a spiritual person, this is going to become a really important issue in you. For example, how does he do that? Galatians 5, 22, 23, the nine fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith. Right? Long-suffering. Self-control. Huh? Is that ringing a bell? He is the comforter. This is his title given by Jesus to him. This is his title. It's identified in John 14, 16 and verse 20. That's chapter it covers chapter 14. In chapter 15, verse 26, he's called the comforter. That covers that chapter. And in verse 16, he's called the comforter. 16, chapter, verse 7. You see, Jesus identified his working title to be the comforter. You know why? Because that's his work in the absence of Christ in your life. The third member of the God, Godhead takes up that slack. It's his responsibility. He is the comforter. He is your comforter. So when you get in those situations in your life where you're distraught, You have a live-in comforter. Who is there to comfort you and meet your needs within your spirit for comfort. Your human spirit. There's probably not a day goes by that you don't get all wound up and stressed in something. It's how you deal with it. It's not that it comes. It should come. You're living in the devil's world. You're living in that body of corruption. That's how you deal with it. And God, knowing that you would be under enormous stress during this period of time, where the comforter, where the third member of the God, God understanding the stress of the angelic conflict in the church age, put the comforter inside every believer to be the great comforter no matter what you're going through. And what he is responsible for in the comforter is to fill the void in your spirit that the presence of Christ could do for you if he was here. And he is doing that very thing with his disciples. For example, John 14. Look at John 14 
as the way, this, way it opens up. Look how Jesus opened up this discussion. He's trying to calm them down because their human spirit is in turmoil, stressed. What's he talking about? Why is he talking this way? Where is he going? Listen to what he said. Here's what he does. When he was in, his, in presence, body form with us, this is what he did. He was a comforter. He's no longer here and won't be here until the second coming of Christ. And so God has sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be the comforter. And where does he live? Next door, right? Now he lives inside your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples who are all stressed out. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going and then another discussion opens up. What is he doing? What is going on in the disciples? Their hearts are troubled. It is evidence that their hearts in trouble because it's reflected in their posture. It's reflected in their, in their face, in their countenance, because it is affecting their spirit. We can see it. We can see it in somebody that we know and say, is something going on? What's wrong? Right? How did we see that? It's going on in their heart, but we saw it in their countenance or in their spirit. We, if we know somebody, we don't have to know them really well. We just have to know them to know that about them, right? Sometimes it can be so obvious you can meet a stranger and you can see their distress. Right? You don't even have to know And so he says, let not your hearts be troubled. What's he doing with these people? He's trying to bring comfort to them. Their circumstances are not going to change, but their heart can. What they're, what they're disturbed about is Jesus going away. And the whole discussion of 14, 15, 16, and 17 is about this. They're confused. They haven't been paying attention in Bible study. And they're operating from old man cosmic thinking. They're not paying attention. And uh, their spirit is troubled. Their heart is troubled. It's evidenced by their spirit, which is reflected in your countenance. Tell me you know this. Well, the next time you really get bent, bent out and stressed out, go look in the mirror. And then you say, well, I've got, to, I've got to fix myself up a little bit before I go out in the public. All right. Let not your hearts be troubled. What's he doing? He's, he's a comforter. But there's going to come a day when he is not going to be here. So what's going to be your great comforter? Indwelling Holy Spirit. How do I know it? He called him by name. He gave him a specific title to meet a specific need and more. So the one thing you can always count on him to be in your life is the comforter. You go to the wrong places to find your comfort first. First should be the one who is in you, who lives with you, who is willing to be more than a comfort to your life, why would you not bring him into play immediately?
Here's the key passage I'm after, John 16. John, the 16th chapter, verses 5 through 7. This is a passage I'm after, my key passage on this idea. He says to him now in the, 15th, in the 16th chapter, he's been doing it. F chapter 14, he's talking about it. Chapter 15, he's talking about it. Chapter 16, he's talking about it. Because in a couple of days, he's going to be gone. By that, I mean he's going to die on a cross, be raised, and then be on a schedule to leave in 40 days. Now I am going to him. Now. Now. But now which is interesting, but now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? Listen to me. False assumptions lead to false interpretations, lead to false expectations, lead to false applications. Book of Job. <laughs> If there's nothing else you learn from the book of Job, please learn that. Just about every Hallmark movie I have watched with my wife has that principle in it. People make a false assumption, make a false interpretation. They have false expectation and make a false application. But thank God, in the end, they all come back and kiss and make up. I love Hallmark for that. But you're going to see this in every movie. Every Hallmark movie they do, that principle is going to be in there. Somewhere it's going to be in there. For those who watch Hallmark, it's going to give you a heads up. I'm going, to, I'm going to him who sent me. But none of you ask me, where are you going? Listen, unless they ask where he's going, they're not, they're not even interested in how he's going. How is he going back to the Father? Through the cross, burial, and resurrection. They're not even interested in really where, let alone how. <laughs> but because I have said these things to you, your sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. That's a point of doctrine. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now think about that idea. It is important that Jesus not be with you in the church age, walking with you through your daily lives, it is to your advantage that I go away. Now watch what the advantage is. The advantage. Look, look. Jesus, when he was on earth, could only be at one place at one time with people, right? I can be with you at the lake or I can be with you in the temple. But when I go back home, the Holy Spirit, the great comforter, will be with every one of you no matter where you are. How about that? Huh? I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper comforter shall not never. That's ukme means never. When you put the two negatives together, it means never. The comforter shall never come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. That's what I'm after. The comforter, the helper, the comforter. It is to your advantage that Jesus goes back because when the Holy Spirit comes, he indwells every believer the same way. And he does the same ministry in their life. He doesn't choose one over another. He doesn't work different in my life than he works in anybody else's life. It, listen, you're missing this. It is to your advantage. Sumfero. 
I think the King James uses the word expedient or something like that. The words but now are bigger than they look because you have a conjunction with an adverb that introduces this idea. The word noon puts you in the now. Somebody calls you up and say, where are you now? You say, I'm in church. How long? Yada, yada. Okay. That sets the clock for him. Where are you now? Somebody traveling. Where are you now? Do you understand the word now? Where are you now? Now watch. To understand this, you've got to look at verse 4. 16.4. These things I have spoken to you that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them and these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. What is this? What is he talking about? He's talking about his absence. The, he, I am going away and going to be absent from the earth. And this is how you're going to survive. And you're going to be in good hands because the third member of the Godhead is going to be in your life i.e. body life, body life, not, not just church life, not just once in a while, all the time. You want to write these down on this word, but now. You wrote down 16.4 because it's related to that. 16.4, write this down. 14.29 and 13.19 because he's been telling that right along. This is not the first time this idea has come up. Verse 5 is connected to verse 4 in chapter 16 and was already stated in 14.29 and 13.19. Write this down. In Luke 24.8, after Jesus was raised from the dead and was ready to ascend back to the Father, it says, and they remembered his words. Ta-da! They remembered his words. They didn't understand him then. They accepted him and later understood him. They were able to pull it together in their life. That's what's important in your life and mine. When Jesus said, I am going, he used the word hupago. It means that hupago is the idea that a, a trip has been planned. A trip has been planned. I'm going. Billy recently and his family went to Alaska. Hupago was an enormous planning went on from point A to point B and the return trip. Rick goes off on a trip. Hupago, it requires great planning. People don't realize camp, it moves very smoothly for one week when it's been well planned for 51. <laughs> it takes 51 weeks to do one week at camp and for it to move the way it should. That's Hubago. I am going. The trip is planned. Present active indicative. I am going to him who sent me. And that's a round trip. Did you see the round trip? Jesus is here. He came here, 
and now he's going back from where he came. It's a round trip. The round trip was planned. Not just coming to earth and dying on a cross, but to return to the Father and to send the Comforter in his place during the church age. What an enormous study. What an enormous study. In, this, in verse 6, chapter John 16, 6, but because I have said, laleo, which is the word communicate, is that this, he said something, he communicated an idea. Laleo means to communicate an idea. Because I said, perfect tense, many times in the past, active indicative, because I said these things, this, this goes all, in the book of Matthew, goes all the way back to chapter 16, where he talks about how he's going. I got to go to Jerusalem, I got to be crucified, yada, yada. But, Allah, because I said, in the perfect tense, communicating clearly Bible doctrine, these things to you, sorrow, definite article with lupe, has filled perfect tense, your heart. Look what's happened. He's told them something that should be joyful. They don't understand it, and therefore it's become sorrowful. I, came, I was sent to earth on a mission to go to the cross and deal with the sins of humanity for all time, all the way from Adam to the end of human history. My job was to come and to die on a cross for the sins of humanity from start to finish. Just think about this. He did it in six hours. That's got to be the longest six hours in, in all of human history. He covered all of the sins of the human race from time to eternity points. He did it in six hours. Actually, he did it in three, but the crucifixion was six. Because I have said and communicated these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Sorrow. See, that's, that's the... Let not your hearts be troubled. He said, the more I talk about this, the deeper you go in misunderstanding. Sorrow should not be in their heart. Sorrow should not be in their heart. Joy should be in their heart. Because why he's going to the cross should bring joy, not sorrow. Because it's about grace salvation. Dying on a cross should be a good thing and it should be joyful for it is through there that the grace of God can save every human person on the basis of grace, not by works. Listen, these boys are looking completely wrong at the idea of death and the death of Jesus Christ. His death went the way of the word of God. He died just the way he was supposed to die out of the teaching of the Old Testament. It's not how he died, it's why he died. And it is that, and to be able to return to the Father is where the joy is. To complete the mission, salute, return back to the Father and be seated at the right hand of the throne. You see, the difference between the disciples and Christ facing death is one has the word of God in their soul and the other doesn't. One has taught the lesson and the other <coughs> has, has not been able to stifle it, has not been able to inhale and exhale it as it was taught to encourage their hearts. He was the comforter. 
he was the comforter in this classroom. And the word of God he spoke to them should have been the great comfort. And their hearts should be filled with joy and is filled with sorrow because they do not understand the joy of the journey. For Christ, he was not ashamed of the cross. It was the Father's will and his good will to the Father that he carried it out. But there is great misunderstanding among the disciples. And listen, sorrow has filled us in the perfect tense. It ain't going anywhere. It's not going to change unless they change their heart, unless they change the way they view, because this, this sorrow that's filled their heart is old man's sorrow. This is not new man's sorrow. This is old man's sorrow. And the perfect tense says they're locked in on this. They're going to be miserable until they change their heart. So are you. You're going to be the same miserable person you are today because you won't change your heart. You won't put off the old man thinking and put on the new man thinking. You won't do it. You'd rather waller in sorrow because it somehow justifies your old man thinking. You got to quit that. You've got to quit that. Just like the disciples had to quit it to get on with their life, you have to do. That's why you're, listen, there's no other reason for God to put you in this church. No other reason. No more than any other reason for these disciples to be in the teachings of Jesus Christ, who is trying to encourage them, come out of this muck and mire stuff you got. Come out of the muck and mire of your life. You don't have to live the way you're living. You know you don't. Listen, please tell me. You know you don't have to live the way you're living. This is a choice you're making, and it's a bad choice. It's a bad one. Only you can change it. The Holy Spirit can't do any more than he's doing to you right now. That's to encourage you that the comfort isn't changed. Here is verse 7. But I tell you the truth, point of doctrine. Watch this now. But I tell you the truth, point of doctrine. A point of doctrine you must understand. It is to your advantage, present active indicative, that I go away. This word go away is like the, the plane is on the runway ready to be boarded. Not the trip being planned. Notice this is a completely different Greek word for going away. Hupargo, the, pla the trip has been planned. Now the plan is in action. The word op on the front of that is apo, erko omai. And the plane is on the runway. We're ready to execute the plan. The plan of the trip, it's now enforced to be executed, exercised. And so he says, it is to your advantage that I go away. The plane is on the runway. In other words, it, in other words, I'm going to the cross. That's a given. The, that's a given. The plane is on the runway, ready to be boarded. For if, third class condition, used to make a point of doctrine, this is not the idea of maybe, yeah, maybe not. This is the execution of the plan has got to run this way. Listen to what he says. For if I do not go away, negative may, plane's on a runway, if I don't board the plane, if I don't go to the cross, the helper, helper, comforter, shall not, ukme, the word not is ukme, it's a double negative, and it means never. Then the comforter shall never come to you. But if, third class condition, this is how it has to roll out. This is the plan, and the plan has got to go the way it was planned. 
if I go, he used a different word. Notice, that's the third word, a different word for going. But where am I? Paromai means, like on Billy's trip, we're leaving Birmingham, we're traveling here until we get to there, our destination. I'm leaving a place and I'm going to a place of destination. If it's a round trip, then he's going to leave that destination place, make a round trip back, point A, point B, point C, until he gets back to the place he started. I love the Greek language. There's no way you could get that. There is no way you could get that scenario without the Greek language, in my opinion. At least I couldn't. <laughs> I'm not saying you couldn't. Most of you are all smarter than I am. I couldn't get it. I couldn't have got it. I'll tell you something else. If I go from one destination to another one, in the plan of God, one place to another. I will send him to you. See the word to you? It's pros plus the accusative, and in the Greek language refers to face-to-face -face or presence. Face-to-face. -face. That's not long distance. Face-to-face -face is not long distance. Would you agree? I mean, there's a long-distance relationship, and there's a close face-to-face. -face. This word is face-to-face. -face. If, but if I go, I will send him to you, what? Face-to-face. -face. The Holy Spirit is face-to-face -face or in your dynamics of your presence. So I laid out. The three different words for going on your paper in the Greek language, I just think it's important. Here's my doctrinal point. So much for getting through three points in an hour. Listen, it's not how fast I go, it's how well you get it. Okay? That's what I've learned in my life. Doctrinal point. Jesus is teaching inhale, exhale of divine truth ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's at 2 Timothy 3, 16, 70. All scripture is God breathed. What he's trying to get him to do is you got to start inhaling and exhaling the word of God to make the corrective changes you need in your life. Your heart's got to be changed. It's not going to be changed any other way other than inhale, exhale the word of God. You can sit around and moan and groan all day long. It doesn't change your life. It just makes you more sorrowful. You want change? You want real change? That's why God sent you here today. It's all about change. Exchange sorrow, disappointments, despair, stress to a place of joy. Joy in the journey. Joy in the journey. It was for joy that he endure, endured the journey. Joy. Joy. Joy is what God is able to give you in the power of the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God working together in your mature soul that just brings a calmness to you. And people go like, I can't understand how you could go through what you're going through and still be so calm about it. This person doesn't even think about it. He's never even thought about it. It's what you do. You don't do it for others. It's just what you do. <laughs> it's what you do. You smell the roses along the journey. No, what they're doesn't matter what they're planted in. Well, I'd smell the I would smell the roses, but you know, I don't like where they are. 
Well, you'll never smell them. That indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit is capable through inhale, exhale of the Word of God to replace sorrow with joy in the loss of something or someone you love. Did you know that? How much of your life do you sit around and get despaired over what you've lost or what you don't have rather than smell the rose that you do have? What you do have is now. What you do have is but now. You do have that, and it's to your advantage. God has indwelt you with the power of the Holy Spirit, the great comforter, and there's no reason for you not to embrace the joy that you have in your journey with Jesus Christ. There's no reason to not do that. Oh, Ron, you say, I know. If you, had, if you walked in my shoes, if you know what I had to do every day of your life, wouldn't change a thing about me. I don't have to walk in your shoes, and you don't have to walk in mine. We've got to walk in our own. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and it's, he never puts you in that situation that you're not prepared to handle wonderfully. Indwelling comforter face to face. You ought to read John 16, 20 to 23 which talks about face-to-face -face reunion. For the believer, it is a joyful celebration. The John 14, 1 through 7, I go to prepare a place for you. It's a joyful celebration. I love what Luke wrote in Luke 15, chapter 7 and 10, when he says, when one sinner repents, when one sinner repents, there's joy in heaven. There's joy in heaven over one sinner who changes his mind about the gospel of Jesus Christ, believes that he died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. You know who rejoices? Whether anybody else in the whole wide world does, all of heaven rejoices with one sinner born again. One sinner born again, all of heaven rejoices. They celebrate. They kill a fatted calf and eat it. I don't know. They rejoice. You know why? That's why Christ came to the earth. And it should. That's why we're here. Why, why do you think we're here? Next time we come back, we'll look at eight. Won't look any more of it today, that's for sure. Well, let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. We'll take a 50-minute break, and we'll come back for the second service. Let not your hearts be troubled. What a wonderful idea, isn't it? Does your heart need to be troubled? No, it's a choice. It's a choice. Your heart doesn't have to be troubled. But your heart may need to be changed. And so, our Father, we thank you today for that. It's not major surgery. Major surgery has already been done. And the Holy Spirit is now in the presence. The ability to bring a new heart into existence. A new heart. Beating the way of the Lord. Where we can experience the joy and the love and the patience and the kindness and the goodness and all the other things that are so important to the human psyche. Those nine are really important to the human psyche. Anybody who's ever studied the human psyche know how important these nine characteristics are of the fruit of the Spirit. And gosh, we have them.
supernaturally produced by the Holy Spirit when we let him do his business, let him do his job. Encourage our hearts to be joyful, to be optimistic. No matter, no matter what we experience. Yet no one asks, where are you going? <laughs> where are you going? There's going to be many stops. From, this, from John 14, 15, 16, there's going to be many stops. There's going to be a stop on the cross, a stop in Sheol, out in the resurrection, 40 days of post-resurrection, before we return. The plan's been tripped. The trip's been planned. It's now a matter of being obedient and following the will of God in each step of the way. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.